गुड डे एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू एपिसोड फोर ऑफ द महाभारता एज एज पॉडकास्ट दिस पॉडकास्ट एक्सप्लोर ईच एंड एवरी चैप्टर ऑफ द महाभारता टेक्सट विच इज द बिगेस्ट एपिक इन ह्यूमन हिस्ट्री इन दिस एपिसोड वी विल डिस्कस द थर्ड सेक्शन ऑफ द महाभारता स्टोरी दिस सेक्शन इज टाइटल्ड पौश्य पार्व एंड इज पार्ट ऑफ द लार्जर आदि पार्व महाभारत टेक्स्ट इज डिवाइडेड इन टू मेन पार्वाज और वॉल्यूम्स एंड सब पार्वाज और सेक्शंस Each main parva has many subparvas just as each volume of a book can have many sections. Please see episode description to understand the classification in more detail. Today's episode is a bit different. It has only been some time since I have launched this podcast and I am very excited to see the feedback and questions pouring through in my inbox. As expression of my gratitude I will try to answer the top 5 questions in the last segment of this episode other questions I will address them in the upcoming episode but don't worry I have them all and finally depending upon the platform where you are listening to this podcast please feel free to leave me a comment question or feedback alternatively you can drop me an email at mahabharataasas@outlook.com please like subscribe and share if you find this podcast useful So far we have barely made a start in the main story and just to put it out there we are still miles away from it. You might remember from previous episodes that the story starts with a sage by the name of Ugarsharva who is attending a ceremony where he meets other sages and priests. There he mentions about a large snake sacrifice once organized by a king by the name of Janamajaya. It is in that snake sacrifice that Mahabharata story is recited. This parv describes the circumstances that led to the snake sacrifice. Sage Ugarsharva or Sauti as he was also called is narrating the story. Before we move on, it is perhaps good time to introduce King Janamjaya at this stage. He is son of King Parikshit. Now you might ask who Parikshit is? Those who are a bit familiar with the story would already know that Parikshit was a grandson of Arjun. the most loved character of the story and to whom many would attribute the ultimate pandava victory in the war in other words janamjaya is the grandson of arjuna i'm sorry great grandson of arjuna so now let's hear the story of the snake sacrificed organized by this great grandson of arjuna king janamjaya has three brothers who once beat a dog The dog cries and rushes to its mother in misery and anguish. Angered by her son's unjust beating and torture, the mother goes to Janamjaya and curses him. Evil shall befall on your kingdom for committing gross injustice against my son. Janamjaya on hearing this curse becomes miserable. He departs to a lonely part of his kingdom to find a sage, one could, who could absolve him. of his sins well technically his brother sins and neutralize the effect of the curse he is concerned very concerned the kingdom which his ancestors had built with their blood has been cursed torn by misery and guilt he enters the ashram of a great sage by the name of shrutasharva in the ashram he is welcomed by sage's son somsharva impressed by somsharva's conduct He appeals to his sage father to let him appoint his son as the royal priest a very prestigious title for a sage Shruti Sharma agrees but then lays out two conditions for this appointment First my son is blessed with special birth he was born out of the womb of a naga his yogic powers can redeem you of any sin except those committed against lord shiva and second he has a secret vow that he shall not refuse any request from a brahman if a brahman asks him anything he is duty bound to comply janamjaya agrees to these conditions and the appointment is thus sealed he departs for his capital city hastinapur with newly appointed priest on reaching his city he introduces somsharva to his brothers and instructs them to follow every order from the priest as long as he is away to takshashila for a war expedition 
the brothers agree and Janamajaya marches to the kingdom of Takshila. What is Takshishila, you might ask? It is old name of the city of Taxila in modern-day Pakistan. Janamjaya wins the war over the kingdom of Takshishila and brings it under Hastinapur's control. So, let's come out of the story mode for a few moments. This Parva, after briefly introducing Janamjaya up to his departure to Takshishila, moves to the story of another sage by the name of Ayodhya Dhyumya. Now let's hear that story out. Once upon a time there lived a sage called Ayodhya Dhyumya. He had three disciples by the name of Uppamanyu, Aroni and Veda. One day Ayodhya Dhyumya asks Aroni to go to the small dam constructed on the nearby river and stop a breach in the dam. Aroni complies and departs to the riverside. He makes every attempt to stop the breach but fails. No object is capable enough to hold the flow of water. Disappointed, he gives up. Feeling guilty and miserable that he could not fulfill his guru's command, he sits down near the river bank. Then an idea strikes him. He uses his own body as an object to stop the flow of water. After a long time, when he does not return to the ashram, a hunting party goes searching for him, led by his guru himself. They cry his name near the river and Aroni appears from the breach. He explains to his guru what happened and how he stopped the flow of water, strictly in accordance with his commands. Ayodhya Dhomya is impressed by daring of this young lad and blesses him. You have obeyed my instructions at the cost of your own life, my son. You will be storehouse of Vedic knowledge and will obtain good fortune. Few days later, Ayodhya Dhumya asks his second disciple, Upamanyu, to look after the cattle. Upamanyu commands a huge body and flat, very flat belly. He does as is commanded spending most of his days and mostly nights with the cattle. After all, Guru's words are equivalent to the words of God. Then one day, in a casual conversation, Ayodhya Dhumya comments on Upamanyu's heavy stature. You are quite fat, Upamanyu. How do you maintain yourself? You must need a lot of food, no? Upamanyu replies and says that he goes out seeking alms every day just like everyone else in the ashram. And the food he receives from the townspeople, he eats all of it away. Ayodhya giggles and replies that as per tradition, all donation receipts that Upamanyu and his fellow students collect on a daily basis must first be deposited in ashram. Upamanyu apologizes and promises to do as commanded. Time passes, but despite restriction, Upamanyu does not lose weight. His guru again comments on his fat body. You seem to be still as healthy as you were months back, Upamanyu. How do you maintain your food intake? Upamanyu replies that after he's done with the first round of begging, which he deposits in the ashram, he goes for the second round. Ayodhya Dhumi explains, in a tone as if barely hiding his anger, that this is not allowed under the ashram rules. He should not be going for a second round because this puts pressure on the townspeople. After all, they might think that ashram people are greedy. Opamanyu apologizes and promises to do as commanded. Time passes, but Opamanyu is in no mood of losing weight. Ayodhya Dhyumya inquires him again as to how he is supporting himself now despite restrictions on second round of begging. Opamanyu replies that because he is taking care of the cattle, milk is readily available. He drinks the milk whenever he is hungry. Ayodhya Dhyumya leans back, sighing. He once again explains to Opamanyu that milk is ashram's property and in other words his guru's property. He should not be enjoying what clearly does not belong to him without his prior permission. 
Upamanyu apologizes and promises to do as commanded yet again. No food, no milk. So Upamanyu decides to instead drink the froth given away by the young calves. There is plenty out there and no one at the ashram needs it anyways. Months later, Upamanyu's body is still gaining weight despite many food restrictions. Ayodhya asks the same question again and Upamanyu replies that he has been drinking the froth given away by the calves as they suckle on their mother's breasts. Ayodhya finds a way to tell Upamanyu how even this is not acceptable. This amounts to stealing food from the young calves who have the first right to their mother's milk. So if Upamanyu wants to drink the froth, he needs both cows and the calves permission which of course won't be granted for obvious reasons. Once again Upamanyu apologizes and promises not to drink the froth either. Deprived of all possible sources of food, Upamanyu wanders in the nearby forest. Almost starving to death, he decides to eat tree leaves. Forest is no one's property and trees aren't going to complain, so that should be fine. Unknown to the fact that the leaves he lays his hands on are of a very poisonous tree named Arka. As he began plucking the tree leaves, the poisonous droplets found their way in his eyes. Screaming in pain and agony, unable to see anything, he keeps rubbing his eyes. Running around almost directionless, not knowing where the next step is going to take him. Not surprisingly, the next step takes him down a shallow well nearby. He lays there, his eyes burning, almost blind, the sensation of hunger now having subsided, unable to lift his weight, sobbing in pain. It's now too late. The sun is already set, but Upamanyu has not yet returned to ashram. Ayodhya thinks that Upamanyu might be angry on him as he has deprived him of food. He organizes a hunting party to look out for him. As the party nears the well, they hear Upamanyu sobbing. Ayodhya yells, What are you doing down there? Sobbing, Upamanyu explains that he ate arka tree leaves and they have turned him blind. Calling on Lord Mahadev, Clearly scared of what this poor lad has done to himself, Ayodhya asks Upamanyu to pray to Ashwinis, the divine doctors who can virtually heal anything. Upamanyu begins a long prayer to Ashwinis while sobbing, barely controlling his pain. Wind blows heavily. A sudden light illuminates the moonless night. First, it is one stream, but then splits into two. The light has no apparent origin, it is coming from nowhere, but is concentrating on one part of the sky as if two giant invisible lasers were firing. Suddenly, the jets of light stop and begin to circle around a common point as if unable to escape the force of some invisible force. The light vanishes into two celestial forms, looking almost identical, the twins. Human figures, but not really. Ashwinis have appeared. Ashwinis look at the poor lad and offer him a cake full of special herbs that can neutralize every known poison. Upamanyu, however, refuses to eat, noting that because his guru has commanded him to deposit the donations first in the ashram, this cake must first be offered to his guru. Ashwinis agree, but explain to him that they had once offered similar cake to his guru, but he ate it without first offering to his own guru. Upamanyu still refuses and says that no matter what, he cannot break his promise. Twin Ashwinis look at each other, clearly impressed. They turn back to Upamanyu and say that they are extremely impressed by his devotion to his Guru as a re and as a reward would restore Upamanyu's eyes and full health. And so it happens. 
the pain disappears and Upamanyu now sees the world just like you and me. Ashwini's hem now disappeared and the night goes dark again. Wind blows normally as Ayodhya along with his other students help Upamanyu out of the well. Upamanyu comes out and bows before his guru who is clearly blown with pride. Impressed by his student, Ayodhya waves all restrictions placed on Upamanyu and blesses him that he shall be a storehouse of Vedic knowledge and an example of a worthy disciple. Veda, the third student of Ayodhya, is unlike the previous two. He is not adventurous, so he may need to be put to test a bit differently. It appears from the story that Veda has already completed his required period at Ashram, but Ayodhya asks him to stay a bit longer. As the old Sanskrit mantra goes, Guru is Brahma, Guru is Vishnu, Guru is Mahesh. Veda complies and stays. He stays back for many months, serving Ayodhya and his household. Surviving on minimum food and not much shelter, he continues to push the limits of devotion that a student has towards his guru. Days pass and then months. Ayodhya now decides to conclude his test and reward his student. He grants him permission to leave. Veda departs to his village and initiates his own ashram, gets married and takes in a few Brahmin lads as his students. He ensures maximum comfort for his students unlike his own guru, clearly having experienced the trials and tribulations of ashram life himself. After some time, two Kshatriyas show up on Vedra's ashram and appoint him as his royal priest. They were Janamjaya and Poshya. One day, Veda is invited to officiate a sacrificial ceremony and asks one of his students named Uttanka to take care of the house in his absence. Uttanka bows with his hands folded and agrees to comply. While Veda is out, his wife gains the right period for birth after an awfully long time. But Veda is far out, perhaps in another state. It will be months before he returns. Other ladies in the village rush to Veda's ashram and after hours of deliberation come up with a solution. They ask Uttanka to stand in place of his guru, i.e. to have physical relationship with his guru's wife so that her period does not go in waste. Uttanka is clear about his principles. He outrightly refuses the request, saying that it is improper for him to do so. After all, Guru's wife is like Guru Mata, equivalent to one's own mother. When Veda returns, he hears what happened behind his back. While fuming at the village ladies, he was clearly pleased with the conduct of his student. He must have thought that Utanka is now a learned person and perhaps this means he has achieved what he came for. A strong moral character and ability to decide between right and wrong. These are the thoughts that must have naturally come to a guru on hearing these events. He asks Utanka that if he wishes, he may leave his ashram and proceed to next chapter of his life. To this, Utanka replies that if he is being let out early, it's a favor on him. Therefore, to receive the favor, he must do something in return. A rightful receiving must be accompanied by a rightful giving, else the receiver and the giver ultimately become each other's enemies. To this Veda replies that he is unable to think of anything immediately that Utanka can do or give, but will get back to him. After some time when Veda hasn't yet replied, Utanka asks the same question again. This time Veda says, that he still does not know what to ask for. However, Uttanka can perhaps ask his Guru Mata, i.e. Veda's wife, if she needs anything. Uttanka is free to go if he brings what Veda's wife needs. He goes to his teacher's wife with the same request. Unlike Veda, she already knows what she desires. 
She asks Utanka to go to King Poshya's capital and bring the earrings that Poshya's wife wears. And he should bring them exactly on the fourth day from now. Utanka at once departs to Poshya's capital. On his way, he sees a large bull with a heavy man seated on it. The man shouts to Utanka and offers him to eat the bull's dung. Utanka must have been angry. How could that man offer a Brahmin dung of a bull? People normally offer food to a passing Brahmin but dung, so he refuses. The man on the bull informs Utanka that this bull is special. Even his Guru Veda once ate it at its dung. Utanka was a bit shocked, but on hearing his Guru's name, he agrees. He eats the dung and drinks the urine. Thanking the men, he immediately rushes to the city. After all, he has a deadline to meet. Fourth day from now, he reminds himself. Utanka is now in the courtroom of Poshya. After greeting appropriately as a king should greet a Brahmin, Poshya says, his hands folded, I shall be pleased to grant you any desire, O respected Brahman. Pleased Utanka at once comes to the point. I am here to ask for your wife's earrings, to give it to my teacher's wife, O great king. It was a request from Brahman, so Poshya did not refuse. He replies that his wife is in the inner apartment of the palace. Utanka can go and ask Poshya's wife for the earrings. Utanka rushes to the inner apartment, but there he finds no one. He calls Queen's name, but no one responds. Clearly angered, he returns to the courtroom and addresses the king in a strong tone. There is no one inside. You should not have lied to me. Poshya replies that his queen is inside, but she will not appear before Utanka because he is impure. He smells of bull dung and urine. Utanka is at once reminded of his encounter with the men on the bull. He thinks to himself that he should have bathed before going to see the queen. And he listens to his thoughts. After proper bathing and cleaning, he goes to see the queen again. This time, the queen appears and bows before the Brahmin. Upon knowing why Utanka was here, she immediately hands over her earrings to Utanka. She also warns Utanka to be careful as he carries those earrings because for some reason, the Naga leader Takshak is also looking for these. Utanka assures the queen that he can easily overpower the Naga and at once leaves for the courtroom. Utanka is now back in the courtroom, and he asks King's permission to leave. Poshya, however, wants him to stay a bit long. After all, Utanka is a Brahmin and should first be hosted properly. The king offers him food. Utanka says to the king that he is very pleased with the, his devotion to the Brahmins, but he is in a hurry and cannot stay any longer. However, he also won't refuse the service and therefore asks the king to bring in whatever food is ready. As instructed by the Brahmin, the food is brought in. Seated, Utanka picks out the first bite and notices that the food is cold and there is a hair in it. Not sure why, but instead of asking the king to replace the unclean food, he shouts a curse. Because you have served this Brahmin unclean food, you shall go blind. Poshya reciprocates the anger with more anger. He shouts a curse back. And you, my lord, shall go without offspring. A few moments later, both realize that this was inappropriate. Poshya inspects the food and finds that Utanka was right. There is in fact a hair in the food and it is also cold. This is unbecoming of a king to serve his guests unhygienic food. He apologizes to Utanka. Now appeased, Utanka forgives the king. But he does warn the king that a Brahmin's curse cannot go in vain. Poshya will go blind for sure, but will soon recover his eyesight. Now that he has almost neutralized the effect of the curse, he asks Poshya to do the same. 
Porsche however apologizes again and says that he's not a Brahmin so unfortunately he does not have enough power to undo the curse. Hearing the response Utanka is enraged at Porsche. He shouts that because he has failed to reciprocate his curse will carry no meaning. Saying that Utanka leaves carrying earrings but without food. It is already the 4th day. Utanka has been traveling as fast as his hungry body allows him. His only medium for his journey back to his guru's wife are his feet and legs. So naturally he gets very dehydrated. On his way back, he stops at the river bank hoping to drink some water and recoup before continuing his journey. He puts down the earrings and begins to move towards the river bank. Not far away from where he stands, he sees a giant creature running away from him carrying the earrings. He dashes after the creature and as he nears, he at once recognizes him, Takshak. Takshak disappears into a giant hole hidden behind the trees. Utanka follows him and emerges on the other side of the hole into an underground kingdom of Nagas. Takshak however is nowhere to be seen. All he sees is a handsome man standing near one of the pillars and two women weaving a black and white thread. A young boy is spinning a wheel with 12 spokes in it. He tries to act friendly in an attempt to lure Takshak out of his hiding, but no luck. There was something about that handsome nameless man that Utanka notices. He tries to persuade him to for help. Turns out that the man was quick to convince. He brings in a giant horse-like structure and places it in front of the open space. He asks Utanka to blow into the horse's anus. Not sure what he was up to, but Utanka took his chances. He did as was asked. As he blew into the hole at the back of the structure, fumes of gas and fire erupted from the horse's mouth. It was some kind of a fire gun that if continues to throw the flames would burn down the entire Naga city. People around panicked and rushed to safety. Takshak was terrified. He could not afford losing the whole city just for a piece of gold. He emerges out of his hiding and hands the earrings back to Utanka, disappearing once again. The nameless handsome man offers Utanka his right back to his guru's wife. Utanka readily accepts. It was already the fourth day and he had already wasted too much time due to Takshak. He climbs the horse and begins to ride away. Veda's wife awaits with countless thoughts going in her head. She is thinking to herself that if Utanka does not make it on time, she is going to curse him. As she heads towards the door, she sees Utanka straddling towards the ashram. He jumps down from the horse and bows to his guru's wife, handing over the earrings. Nearby Veda, sensing something must have been wrong, inquires Utanka as to what took him so long. Utanka explains everything that happened including what Takshak did. He further explains that in route he saw a large bull and a heavy man riding it. Then at Naga city he saw two women weaving black and white thread and a young boy spinning a wheel with 12 spokes. Then he speaks about the strange man agreeing to offer help and getting him here quickly on his horse. Veda however does not look surprised. Utanka is quick enough to read his face. Was it by design Guruji? he asks Veda explains that yes it was by design and the purpose was to test Utanka the bull that he saw was Aravat and upon that was riding lord Indra himself the threads those two women were weaving the black represented the night and the white represented the day the wheel with which the young boy was spinning was the wheel of time with each spin equal to an year perhaps a reminder that time was running out the handsome man that helped utanka in the naga city was also lord indra the horse he offered him was agni 
Takshak had done everything possible to ensure that Utanka never makes it on time. Utanka was pleased to know these details but was equally frantic at Takshak. He took leave and rushed to Hastinapur to see King Janamjaya. King Janamjaya has just returned from Takshashila. While he was briefing his ministers on victories, Utanka marched into the courtroom. He confronts the king and says that he is relishing his childish victory but his real enemy is out in the open. He informs the king that Takshak was responsible for the death of his father, the late King Parikshit. Janamjaya is shocked. His fury is off the roof when he hears the details of his father's death from his ministers. It was Takshak who unjustly killed his father. Janamjaya now wants revenge. On advice of Utanka, he orders his prime minister to organize the snake sacrifice. Millions of serpents will now pay the price. This parve ends here with the vow to organize a snake sacrifice. In summary, we started with a very brief introduction of King Janamjaya, who wanted to neutralize a curse leveled upon his kingdom. He goes to see a sage called Shruti Sharva, and there he meets his son Som Sharva, who he appoints as his royal priest. The Parva then goes into the story of an other sage called Ayodhya and his three students. If you're thinking why we need that part in the story, which technically it wasn't relevant, then you are on the right track. There is quite a digression in this parva, just like the ones before. Arguably, one can say that a context of the snake sacrifice was needed. After all, it was Utanka, the student of Veda, who in turn was student of Ayodhya, who inspired King Janamjaya. But then, story could have just started with Utanka or at most Veda. Why need to recount the story of Ayodhya Dhomya and his other two students besides Veda? Is there a similar pattern of digression and random stories in the rest of the text as well? Or these stories in fact have any relevance with the actual Mahabharata story at all? Are these being told just for the sake of telling them? We'll wait to see in the upcoming episodes. So just before we conclude, let's get into some questions that you had sent me via email. First of all, thank you very much for listening and taking time to write to me. As I promised at the start of the episode, I will answer top 5 of those questions. But as I said, I have them all and I will take them up in the subsequent episodes. So starting with the first question. This question is why we should read Mahabharata? Well, the answer is provided in the text itself, but at a very high level. In Indian literature, human existence has fourfold objectives. Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. These objectives come very naturally to us if you think about it. As Sauti tells us in episode 3 that this story is the detailed account of these fourfold objectives. So. Pick any character from the story and you will see how each character is essentially chasing one or more of these objectives. So what are these four objectives? Dharma is a wider concept. In the context of a fourfold objectives, it means our innate talents, our unique abilities, what we are best at. Are you good at painting, at singing, at numbers? Whatever it is, that is your dharma, what you are good at. Artha is our desire for abundance. We want money and wealth. This is what we call Artha. If you think that desire for money and wealth is the product of the capitalist society, well, then think again. Forget about the contemporary economic systems. Think about the time when we were just hunter-gatherers, many, many thousands of years ago. They were also chasing earth. For them, abundance meant a place where there is no shortage of food. With time and age, the definition of what earth means may have changed, but the desire for the abundance always remains. Karma is simply love and emotions. It is both the desire to procreate 
and to feel a sense of emotional connection. Perhaps this does not need any more explanation, suffice is to say that our very existence and evolution is the direct result of karma. And finally is moksha or self-realization. This appears to many as a quasi-religious concept but it is not. If dharma is the unique talent, moksha is the meaning. You may have a unique talent but where exactly you would employ that unique talent to satisfy yourself? To find the answer to that where question and then to live it is what we call self-realization or moksha. Therefore, one of the reasons why you should read Mahabharata is to explore how each of the characters struggle to achieve their versions of dharma, artha, kama and moksha. Next question is a little bit interesting. This question is, what is your view of the TV adaptations? Do they necessarily give you the complete picture? Well, look, the TV adaptations are really good. They bring to life the individual characters of the story, but of course, there is a lot of editing that is required per se to make it, to make it audience friendly. But broadly speaking, the key messages they cover do coincide with what we find in the unabridged version of the story. I was exposed to Mahabharata's story through B.R. Chopra's Mahabharata. I was just 8 or 9 years old at that time. So my lesson at that time was how to shoot an arrow. If today I watch the same Mahabharata, my lesson would be completely different. So there is no good or bad, it simply depends upon how we want to interpret it. I am sure you know about Bhagavad Gita as well. Arjuna heard it from Krishna directly and he was freed from his anxieties. Dhritarashtra also heard it through Sanjaya at the same time as Arjuna. But the impact on him was he grew even more anxious. So it really comes down to the person at the end of the day. Third question that I chose was that do you really believe that Mahabharata was written by Ved Vyasa? Did he really exist? Well, only three people can know the answer. One is a historian, two is an academic, a third is a scientist. And I am none of these. But let's just ask yourself, does it really matter? If you ask my own view, the original in the very first version, according to the text itself, only had about 8,000 shlokas. Yes, this is according to the text itself. It was then increased to about 24,000 shlokas and then expanded to 90,000 shlokas. This is what text itself is telling us. So after Ved Vyasa has completed the first 8,000 shlokas, the story continued to evolve. So we don't know whether Ved Vyasa existed or not. And it does not matter anymore. What matters is what is in that story that can inspire us. And as I said before, as, as a response to the first question, it is in my view, and I agree with Sati on this, it's a complete manual of the fourfold objectives of human existence. Fourth question is why should or oh, sorry, why does Sati feel the need to outline the whole story first? Isn't he giving away the spoilers? Well, that's a very good question. Well, if you read the story, he never gives away any spoilers. Imagine a group of sages completely unaware of the story and that to such an extensive uh, text. You might want to give them a bit of a trailer before exposing them to the whole movie, no? So, I, I would say think about it as trailer 1, trailer 2. So if you recall, in one of the parvas he actually gives a summary, trailer 1. In the next parva he gives the outline, trailer 2. Alright, so now we have the last question. And that is, what is the difference between abridged and unabridged versions of Mahabharat? Well, in my view it's a very simple equation. Mahabharata is the story of Kauravas and Pandavas. If anything appears unconnected to these characters, you take it out, it becomes the abridged version. Let me give you a spoiler alert here. 
the great ramayana epic we all are aware of it that epic is recounted in mahabharat yes ramayana is discussed at length in the text itself but hardly any abridged version even mentions the fact tv adaptations do not give you a hint of this and that's the reason why i started this podcast to give you a full flavor of how extensive the story is there is an academic consensus that this story must have been composed over a period of at least 1000 years 1000 years just imagine anyways so i hope i have answered all of your questions in sufficient detail please feel free to send more questions either in the comments or via email with that we'll end this episode here in next episode we'll cover the fourth sub parva in the adi parva called poluma parva until then goodbye and take care